Hi, my name is uh, Pranav Rajpurkar, and I'm an assistant professor of biomedical informatics at Harvard Medical School. Over the past many years, I've been working on building artificial intelligence technologies for improving medical decision making. And today, I want to share with you what it takes to safely translate these technologies into improving patient care. My group thinks about this uh, as a solution which requires three pieces. The first is this quest to develop algorithms that can rely on a small amount of labeled data, but use the large swaths of unlabeled data for patients that we have available. Second, we need to be thinking about the creation and curation of great data sets that will allow us to unlock the next generation of medical AI technologies. Finally, we need to be thinking about how we go about integrating these toolkits into the hands of clinicians, of patients, to bring them into practice. Today, I want to talk in particular about images and sensors, where we've seen some of the biggest advances in medical AI over the past few years, and I want to talk about some of the translation challenges that we've tackled over the past few years. I want to start by talking about label-efficient medical AI. Just a few years ago, the, some of the first demonstrations that we could build algorithms that could do tasks at the level of clinical experts were shown. I was involved in an effort to look at chest x-rays, which is the most common medical imaging modality, and from those chest x-rays be able to detect several different pathologies. Or we could look at electrocardiograms, which are used on over 200 million patients annually. And these record the electrical activity of the heart. Can we look at the electrical activity that comes off these sensors to be able to detect abnormal heart rhythms just as a cardiologist would? Now, since then, fast forward a few years, we're now tackling a different problem. The problem we're tackling is how do we go about developing methods that allow for just using a small amount of labeled data to be able to still perform at the level of experts? How do we enable our development of these algorithms using our knowledge of medicine, of physiology, to design better algorithms? How do we combine different modalities? We have images, we have text, we have images and text that go together. Could we leverage this multimodality to be able to develop very good algorithms? And can we apply them across modalities to say, like the stethoscope that records uh, lung and heart sounds, could we use those to recognize abnormalities automatically? The second prong is data sets. And we're aware in and out of medicine, data sets have played a major role in advancing AI methods. In natural language processing, the design of great data sets was responsible for enabling a whole ton of applications that opened up. Similarly, in medicine, the curation of large data sets, including for medical image recognition, have enabled us to develop lots of different algorithms. But what's the challenge that we face today? Well, I would argue the primary challenge that we're facing today is to say, can we be confident that these algorithms we're developing is gonna work on every single one of us. We need these algorithms to generalize across geographies, across patient populations, across clinical settings. And there are lots of questions that come up. Can we take some of these algorithms that were developed in uh, developed countries and apply them to less developed countries? Can we take algorithms that we're developing in the natural domain, such as these chatbots that we're developing, and apply them to problems in medicine, such that they treat patients who have different demographics in the same way? Can we look at all of the medical data that we're collecting, which is stored in free text, and still make sense of it? And finally, when we have these black box algorithms, could we still try to leverage insights into when to use them and what we shouldn't because they will fail. These are some of the questions driving open benchmark curation right now in the field. Finally, I think talking about AI tools without talking about how we use them is only tackling part of the issue. We need to be thinking about clinician AI collaboration. 
And some of the very first studies here that say, here's an AI tool, I'm gonna give it to a clinician, and let's see how they do, have mixed results in terms of whether or not clinicians actually improve with the use of the tool. And I'll be talking about some of that today. But the main challenge for us as a field going forward is how do we enable human AI collaboration to be optimized in the context of real clinical workflows and apply those to different clinicians such that everyone can benefit from the use of these tools. I wanna now deep dive into each of these concepts. Let's start with the first one, which is the development of algorithms. And let me take you through the thought process of where we are and where we wanna be. It's clear that there have been rapid advances in medical AI over the past few years. We have over 100 FDA-cleared technologies, lots in radiology and cardiology, that are able to do a ton of different tasks really well. We have lots of randomized control trials that show evidence that these can improve some sort of a patient outcome. And then we now have CMS coverage of these AI algorithms that say every time one of these algorithms is used in practice, there's a reimbursement that's associated with its use. And that's great. But I think it's not scalable. And the reason it's not scalable is that it's difficult and expensive to scale the way we've been developing these algorithms to capture every single thing that we would like to diagnose or treat. There have been two ways that technically we've thought about solving this problem. One of them, which has been the paradigm for the past few years, which has been transfer learning, and one of them, which is a more emerging paradigm of self-supervised learning. Let me walk through what these look like. The idea behind transfer learning is let's learn a great starting point for being able to do my medical task of interest. How do we do this? Well, we could first have a network learn how to recognize different objects and images. And then we say that's a starting point. That's a starting point to now look at labeled medical data, that's an x-ray image annotated for different diseases, and now update the network to be able to do that task really well. Okay, and now that we do that, we can apply that even to 3D medical data in the following way. We can say 3D medical data, such as the slices of knee MRIs that you see here, are really just different 2D images that we can think of independently, and for each one of them, extract the relevant features and then combine them at the end. And this simple idea can work relatively well. We can identify different diseases from this set of images. But there was an idea that we got excited about a couple of years ago that asked the following question. If we could have a great starting point for doing 2D medical images from images of the world, could we have a great starting point for 3D medical images by looking at videos in the natural world? And the idea could work something in the following way. Basically, let's look at YouTube videos. And for each YouTube video, let's first have a network recognize what is the activity, what is the human activity that takes place in that YouTube video. That could be playing darts. And once it recognizes that, then we fine tune that network to look at CTs of the abdomen to be able to say, does the CT of the abdomen have any signs of appendicitis? And we can apply this pretty well to show great improvement in performance and this improvement that applies across various ways of designing the convolutional neural network. And we can do this not just for one task, but for very different CT interpretation tasks. You can do this for a head CTA on the left or a chest CT on the right. But I wanna talk about a paradigm that I think is going to change the way we've been developing these algorithms across all of medical AI, which is self-supervised learning. The idea behind self-supervised learning is to change the pre-training method such that we're looking at the medical domain we're interested in and looking in particular at the unlabeled data that we have available. So in conventional supervised learning, what you might have is a model that learns using labeled medical data. In the transfer learning paradigm we've been used to, you would start by natural images and then you would adapt to medical images. But in the new paradigm of self-supervised learning, what you might first do is take a look at unlabeled medical data and learn using that as a starting point, and then apply your knowledge to a downstream task of interest, such as identifying a particular disease of interest. Great, 
Now, how do we actually do this? So let me use an example outside of medicine first, and let me bring it into medicine. The idea is illustrated with the following example. We have two views, what I'm gonna call views, of uh, a single person here, that's Einstein. And then I have a view of a different person, that's Jennifer Lawrence. And what I'd like to do is when a neural network learns to embed these images in a high dimensional space, I would like the embeddings of the two views of the same person to be close to each other and the two views of different people to be far away from each other. And now, once I've had the network learn this, I can use this network for all kinds of interesting tasks, such as saying, this is a photo of Einstein. All right, so how does this apply to medicine? The question is, how do we generate those two views of a person? Here, this person is gonna be an X-ray, and the way we're gonna think of two different views is we might think of rotating that image differently and asking the network to learn, hey, these are two different rotations of the same patient's chest X-ray. Or we can use it to be able to apply it to lung and heart sounds using ideas that are used in speech recognition very commonly, which is turn my audio into a spectrogram and then mask out components of that spectrogram in frequency and time space, and then say those are two different views of the same patient's lung and heart sound recorded. We can now, in medicine, in a lot of these scenarios, to the design of these algorithms, add in specific components using medical or physiological knowledge. Here we're able to say for electrocardiograms, which record the electrical activity of the heart, maybe one way we can generate these views could be, let's think about what the cardiac activity would be if the heart were rotated slightly to the left or slightly to the right. And that's the way I could come up with the view. And one exciting opportunity, which I think is completely untapped in medicine, is how we think about integrating in different data sources. When doctors are making decisions about patients, they're not looking usually at just one piece of the puzzle. They're looking at as many pieces of the puzzle that they possibly can that are relevant to solving the problem. If we're able to record patient mobile data from their smartphones or from wearables, if we're able to integrate in genomic data, medical imaging data, and health record data like labs, then we might be able to do so much more than if we're looking at a sliver of a patient's journey. Let me give you an example, a very simple one that illustrates this concept. When medical images are typically acquired, they're usually read by a radiologist and a radiologist dictates a report that is then stored along with the image. One idea that we explored recently was to say, let me have a network learn a very simple task. That simple task is going to be, I'm gonna to learn to match an image, a medical image, with its corresponding report to say, does this image match this report, or do they correspond to different patients? And once I start doing that, I'm able to learn a model that's able to look at an image, look at a potential disease diagnosis, and say whether or not that disease diagnosis, which it may have never seen before in that exact language, actually matches the image of interest. And this is what we call zero-shot classification, where I've learned to identify diseases and do just as well as experts can without having ever explicitly seen a labeled example of that particular medical image. And this is very powerful. We can use this idea for actually generating the report from the image itself to say, here's an image, here's a report, let me match these to each other, and let me see which report out of hundreds of thousands or millions of reports that have been read actually would closely match this patient in the future. That's our first piece, the algorithms. Let me talk about an equally important piece of the puzzle that we need to tackle, which is clinician-AI collaboration. How do we enable these tools to be effectively integrated to the people that are actually going to be using them? And the question that we're asking has changed from, how does a model compare to a clinician on a set, this is the versus setup we've been dealing with for the past many years, to a new kind of a setup in which we're saying, what happens when we give this tool to someone versus if they didn't have the tool in the first place? And I wanna walk through the design of this experiment with you. So let's say we're looking at 
a fairly complex task, which is the interpretation of an EMR. So on the left, you have how a radiologist might typically approach this particular uh, read. And on the right, what we're going to do is we're going to start very simple. We're going to provide three small pieces of information, which is what is the likelihood that there is an abnormality in this scan? What is the likelihood that there is an ACL tear? What is the likelihood that there is an MCL tear? And using these very three simple numbers, we're going to see how radiologists will improve the task. How do we measure that? Well, let's have them read these set of cases once without any assistance, and let's have them read it once without ass with assistance. And the order in which they do that is randomized across radiologists. And now we can observe, did people actually improve? And here are the results. So you see on abnormality, ACL tear, meniscal tear, and specificity, sensitivity, and accuracy. And you can see on the right of that uh, vertical black line is where improvement is. And you can see one improvement there on the ACL tear. What this corresponds to is out of 100 people who have the scan, who don't actually have an ACL tear, we're going to send five fewer people to surgery. Now, there's a big assumption is that this has to actually translate when we use it in hospitals on patients which are very different than the patients we might have trained this algorithm on. But let's take our thought experiment a little further. You might ask the question, how am I supposed to believe three numbers? We haven't had the algorithm explain how it got these three numbers, so let's use a different kind of a paradigm. Let's say, rather than outputting these numbers, this black box algorithm, why don't we have an algorithm that shows us where the abnormality is? And here, we're looking at a different task. We're looking at the head, and we're trying to identify aneurysms in the brain. And on the right, you can see AI assistance in the form of the segmentation of the image saying, here, I found the aneurysm, the ballooning of the vessel in the brain. You can take a look at it and see if you agree with it. And we're going to run a similar experiment. And now we find that there is an improvement in the sensitivity, the specificity of the interpreting clinicians. Now, all that's great, but it does lead to a very natural question, is did everyone actually benefit from the use of this tool. And so we can break it down. For every clinician, did they have an improvement or did they not have an improvement when they got access to this tool? And you can see the blue is their um, performance augmented and the orange is their performance unaugmented. And you can see that some radiologists actually have an increase while others don't have an increase in their performance. And that should strike you as surprising. We're saying here that there's a tool that's having different impact on different people. So that's a consideration we'll come back to soon. But I want to talk about what is it going to take for us to put this into clinical workflows? Well, one piece of the puzzle we haven't thought about yet in these examples that I've shown you is that clinicians are responsible not just for looking at one piece of the information, one piece of the puzzle, the integrating in different factors into their decision making. So here's an example which I'm going to claim is a little more similar to a real clinical workflow in which a set of physicians is going to determine whether a patient has active tuberculosis based on a combination of their clinical information and the image, the x-ray image they, they have available. And this is going to be for a fairly difficult uh, population to do this task on, which is of HIV-positive patients. And so we're going to design the study in the following way, where some of the cases the physicians are going to see with assistance, and some of the cases they're going to see without assistance. When they do see assistance, it's going to come in the following form, where there is a heat map over the image showing the regions of the image which are most indicative of the patient having tuberculosis. And on the bottom, you can see on a scale, what is the likelihood from very unlikely to very likely of this patient having active tuberculosis. And now we want to prime, we want to train these physicians to get used to this tool. The way we do that is to say, let's start with some training examples where we'll see some images with some assistance and we'll ask the physicians to make the decision of whether or not there's active TB and let's give them feedback immediately on whether they were right or wrong. So now as a physician, you could calibrate 
to whether or not you want to use the AI in certain instances. Great. So here's what happens. You can see accuracy, sensitivity, specificity once again. Let's focus on the accuracy number for now. You can see that clinicians have now improved their performance from 0.6 to 0.65. That's great. But here was the result that shocked us, is that if you had the algorithm simply working by itself without any clinician oversight, you could actually reach an accuracy of 0.79. Now this should shock you, this should surprise you as a number, because what this is saying is that the algorithm itself could do better than the clinicians who have access to the output of that algorithm. It does make us naturally wonder why this might be. So you can look at the breakdown of the physicians and see who is benefiting, and you see a fair number of interesting points here. You see that some of the physicians are improving a lot with the use of the tools. Others, maybe not so much. Others are actually having a reduction in their performance using the tool. But in all cases, the model is actually outperforming the assisted physician. This could be because of mistrust in the algorithm's output or an overconfidence in the clinician's own diagnosis of the case. So what I hope that I have convinced you that this idea that just because we have AI that performs at the level of experts, we can improve how people perform with the use of the AI is actually misguided. And we need to be thinking about the experience levels of the users, the clinician interaction, the case difficulty, and long-term we need to be thinking about automation bias. What does it mean for training? if we're giving these tools into the hands of clinicians who have never maybe seen an interpretation without the use of these tools in the future. The last piece of the puzzle I wanna talk about is open benchmark curation. It's no secret that curating great data, especially in the context of medicine, is really hard. It requires partnership with hospitals. It requires IT frameworks for de-identifying data, for bringing them between different systems, and then it often requires expensive manual annotation. But one of the key insights over the past few years has been how can we get around this bottleneck of needing expensive manual annotation? And I'd like to show you how we can get creative with this step. I'd like to use as an example the release of the National Institutes of Health um, data set called Chest X-ray 14. And the way this data set was annotated was to say, rather than have someone read the images explicitly for disease A, disease B, let's look at the reports associated with those images when they were read. And what I'm gonna do is build a natural language processing system that reads these reports and says, is a disease present or absent? And I'm gonna label the image accordingly. Okay, so in theory, that sounds like a great idea. In practice, it has problems. And the biggest problem with that is going to be noise. So this is a random sample that was shown um, on a blog post that came out at the time in 2017, uh, a few months after this data set was released, that pointed out uh, using these um, red and orange boundaries where there was disagreement between the radiologist who was looking at these images and the actual labels that were assigned to these images. Let me illustrate the complexity of this task. What does it actually look like to give you a flavor? So on the left is what we start out with, and on the right is where we want to get to, which is the output of the system. Now, we can break down this system into really two pieces. One is we want to recognize all of the mentions of diseases in red, and then we want to associate the mentions of those diseases with two attributes. One of them is whether or not they're associated with a negation and the other is whether or not they're associated with some sort of a expression of uncertainty. For example, you have cardiomedistinal silhouette, which refers to whether or not the cardiomedistinum is enlarged. And then we have a term preceding it called unremarkable. And what this is saying is actually the patient does not have this particular disease, so we need to understand that in order to be able to approach the labeling task correctly. Similarly, we have the word or, and we need to understand that that is associated with the uncertainty surrounding whether or not there is infection that's found on this particular image. But we can tackle these problems, and that's what we did. And 
we saw that we could achieve a fairly high performance from the application of these tools. But the true test of these tools is not how they work on the data which you use to develop them on, but how they work on a completely different data set. And so we applied it to a completely different data set from a completely different hospital. And luckily, in this case, we found that it generalized relatively well. And that's how we released one of the largest data sets to the community for chest x-rays called uh, the Chexpert data set. And this was back in 2019. And along with that, we've also released other data sets uh, like Mura or MRNet. And this is work that uh, we did when I was at Stanford with uh, Dr. Matthew Lundgren and Kurt Langlotz. Great, so why do we do these data sets? Why do we put these out for the community? Well, one, we know how to model disease detection better. Some of the things we've learned from the thousands of users that have competed on this particular benchmark has been that we can really incorporate two ideas into the modeling really well. One of them is hierarchies, and you see hierarchies all the time in medical situations. How do we go about using this hierarchy, incorporating this in the way we train these algorithms? The other one is uncertainty, another feature that's not unique to medicine, but certainly present in every single case that you can think of. And how do we best incorporate the uncertainty into our modeling is another piece that we've learned. But with all of this advancement, let me not give you the picture that this is a rosy place to be in terms of data sets. Because I think in several ways, we're actually far away from where we want to be to a point at which we can easily develop plug and play useful algorithms. And these are some of the ways in which we're lacking. We have poor coverage of diseases in the current data sets that we have. We have poor vari variation in patients. We often have poor generalization across clinical workflows as a result. A lot of these algorithms that we're developing have no way to approach the use of clinical context or the use of priors, these things that doctors use all of the time when making decisions. Let me show you some of the ways in which we're tackling these bottlenecks. Let's start with poor coverage of diseases. Now, I showed you earlier how we could go from that report on the left to the structured labels on the right, which showed whether or not a particular image had 14 different diseases. But how do we extend that to 100? How do we extend that to 500? Well, one way we've been thinking about approaching the problem is to say, let's construct a knowledge graph out of an individual document. What this document graph will capture is it will capture all of the entities that are important in a free text report and also what are the important relationships between those entities that we want to retain. Now this is a really, really interesting side benefit, which is that if you think about one of the biggest risks we have when processing medical data, it is leaking personally identifiable information. But when you go from the personally identifiable information, risky uh, text on the left to the graph on the right, you can see that we've managed to strip out this personally identifiable information and yet keep the content of interest, and that's very powerful. Let me talk about another aspect that we've been tackling, which is poor generalization across clinical workflows. Now, when we were working on chest x-ray interpretation, we were surprised to learn that one of the biggest use cases in developing countries was the application of these technologies would have to be to x-ray films. In a lot of these places, there were no digital copies of chest x-rays that were being used for interpretation. There were these films that were used. So how do we take an algorithm that was developed for digital chest x-rays and apply them to films of chest x-rays? Well, one idea is that we could develop an app which allows you to snap a picture of a chest x-ray and then do its interpretation. Now, we can build this app, and we did, but one of the big machine learning challenges here is, well, does the model actually work on these photos I'm capturing? Because these photos are unlikely to be perfect. How much time am I going to spend as a doctor to actually acquire these photos? They're obviously going to have background which doesn't have chest x-rays, and we're going to see a drop in performance. And that's exactly what we see. We see a performance drop when we apply these algorithms to photos of chest x-rays. So how, I, how might we begin to tackle that? This is a distribution shift that we're seeing, 
And we want to tackle that by bringing our solution that we've developed in the lab out into practice. Well, one of the ways we can approach it is to approach it from a data angle, to say, can we generate a large data set which looks like our deployment setting? And what we did here was we enabled a way to construct at scale lots of different images which simulated this deployment setting to say, what would a chest x-ray image look like if it were acquired through a camera phone? And then using uh, a test set from a deployment setting um, in Vietnam through partnering with uh, VinBrain, we actually developed this. And we have a competition that we've released out to the world called Checks Photo, which allows us to measure the community's progress on this particular task. Finally, I want to talk about the last challenge that we're um, tackling here, which is poor heterogeneity in patients. And this has been a big problem in the field over the past many years, is that we're looking at data from a very, very small part pockets of the world. And if we're trying to build algorithms that apply to each one of us, this just simply cannot be the path forward. In particular, we need to make sure that when we're validating these algorithms before they have approval from regulation or before hospitals decide to adopt them, that they truly work on every individual. And towards this goal, one of the things we've try, tried to set up over the past few months is the Medical AI Validation Consortium. And now we are an international effort uh, that has uh, 16 cities, eight countries, four continents, and about 60 plus institutions that are in the part of joining our, our effort together. And we're starting by asking, can we establish a data set that's gonna span all of these different settings for initially chest X-ray interpretation that's gonna allow us to say, how well do these models actually generalize to a national or international population? Do they work on the different subpopulations or should we be worried? And if we should be worried, then we need to change regulation. We need to change policy around the way we're actually going about saying these algorithms are safe to use. Great, I wanna finally end today by talking about some of the ways we're equipping the community to play a role in the medical AI transformation. Uh, beyond some courses at Harvard and Stanford, one of the things that we're doing is trying to bring uh, a larger group into being able to develop these medical AI algorithms and thinking about some of the challenges and opportunities. And towards that goal, I helped develop a Coursera course called AI for Medicine, if you're interested in what's going on on the industry side of things, uh, you can check out the AI Health podcast. And if you're interested on the science, the research, the cutting edge research that uh, is going on, of which there's a lot right now, uh, one of the things we've been trying to do is parse that and help the community keep up to date. We do that in the Dr. Penguin uh, newsletter. A lot of the work that I spoke with today was done with uh, a large group of people. I'd like to thank those people for enabling the kind of work that we're able to do and hopefully uh, work towards the world in which we're using these technologies regularly on patients and improving lives. So I'll end there, take some questions. Thank you for having me. If you have questions, feel free to shout it out and I'll repeat them for everyone else. Yes? Thanks, great, great, great talk. Um, what about the implications? Uh, I, I'm in healthcare and uh, one of the challenges that we had was the physicians were very receptive to using the model. Is there any concern about the legal implications of such work? If somebody comes up and says, Sure, I'll repeat the question, which is um, regarding legal implications of the use of these models in practice. So there are a couple of paradigms here. One of them is that the AI is an assistive tool, and an assistive tool allows me as a physician to do my job better, but I make the final decision. In this case, the liability is mine. The tool has acted as an assistive tool. There's another paradigm, one which is 
I would say newer, emerging, which is the tool itself is an autonomous tool. It can make decisions on its own. And in this case, the liability is on the developers of the algorithm. And that's why there, there, there are a couple of examples here, at least one, uh, which has a liability insurance to say, we're developing an autonomous AI, and this is how uh, liability is going to work. Uh, it's an evolving landscape, uh, and one that we'll see evolve fairly rapidly, I think, in the next few years. Question here and then there. That's a great question, so let me repeat it. Um, were we integrating these uh, decisions, predictions made by the tools into the EHR such that they would be seen by the physician for their patients? So the studies that I've shown today uh, were retrospective. In this, we were looking at uh, previous patient cases and we weren't focused on the prospective side of things. There have, however, been results on the prospective side where the results were uh, the predictions of these tools were incorporated into the workflow um, and their effect on some clinical outcome was assessed. This has been uh, done in a variety of different use cases, including in radiology for bone age prediction, for instance, also in gastroenterology, being able to detect colon polyps and looking at the adenoma detection rate and to see whether that was improved with the use of these tools. There was a question there and then one there. Yeah, so um, let me repeat the question, which is uh, on the assistance studies that I showed, uh, did we control for the physician group and the patient group? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we even controlled in some cases in some of these studies for the physician experience, uh, and certainly there was, there was case control as well. Sure, that's a great question. So let me repeat that, which is, um, I'm gonna rephrase, why imaging? And is there any potential for non-imaging based uh, AI? So let me, let me take that in, in two parts. One of them is that imaging is the transformation that I think was most enabling initially in terms of the application of deep learning methods. And I would say the other front here has been the application to text. And so it's natural that we have seen most progress in the application and development of these algorithms to 2D and medical, 3D medical images, which do share some of the same uh, context as in the natural image space, but in some ways they're very unique, very different, very challenging, and that's where there's been uh, a lot of work. Now, one question um, that we think about when thinking about the use of non-medical uh, image data or any kind of data in making these decisions is, is the signal complex enough that we can capture it with deep learning in a way that we can't do with simple models. 
Let me give you an example of that. If there is a um, somewhat nonlinear relationship, then you could consider applying a traditional machine learning algorithm to be able to pick up uh, whether that's a decision tree or a boosted decision tree to be able to understand those relationships just as well. And so that's where deep learning as a tool has unlocked less potential compared to the kinds of tools we already did have available, which are now, by the way, faster. They work on uh, tens of millions of patients more easily because they're scalable. But I don't think it's where deep learning has had a shift in terms of how we think about capturing the available structure and the relationship between those inputs to the outputs of interest. Um, that being said, there's a lot of exciting work going on in the application to non-image data and in the application to imaging combined with other data that allows us to better contextualize some of the interpretation with what we have access to. Great, we got two questions and I think we'll take three and those will be our three questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the question is about contrastive learning and whether or not we have seen uh, contrastive learning be applied to chest x-rays to show that we can use a small number of examples, maybe for rare diseases, and do really well. And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, some of our work uh, initially thought about how do we augment chest x-rays differently to be able to produce that using our learnings from the natural limit space. But then since some of the ideas that we can apply specifically to medical images is the use of metadata to say that if I have for patients two different chest x-rays from two different days, I can use those as part of my contrastive learning schema. Some of the things we've also done is thought about can we use the uh, contrastive learning between images and text to be able to enable learning to happen. And some of those results I showed with zero shot detection were about enabling uh, those disease detections to happen without explicit training examples, um, and we see pretty high results. There's a question here, and then one I lost somewhere, but let's go to the question here. Good question, so let me repeat it. Uh, when we saw the results of the assisted clinicians versus the AI by itself, did we see that the clinicians were likely to lean on the side um, of saying something was there, or recommending additional testing um, compared to the, to the algorithms by themselves? Um, we did test this hypothesis, and it wasn't true. Um, there is a cost, as, as you might be aware, to actually also saying, uh, especially in the TB um, uh, setting, of saying that this person did have TB because antibiotic resistance is something uh, that, we're, um, that we're taking into consideration. Also, the other consideration uh, for that study was, if not TB, what else is it? Uh, and we need to start treating for that. Um, uh, fairly quickly. So um, I think the trade-off between um, specificity and sensitivity does not itself explain the differences that we're seeing. Question here.
That's a good question. So uh, the question is, what sort of checks do we do to see how these algorithms are performing across different populations, especially in the context of our recent knowledge um, that um, these algorithms um, are able to uh, uh, detect maybe things like race and also our existing awareness that uh, we're going to have um, biases in the way that um, medicine is uh, practiced uh, across different communities and, and um, how do we tackle that? So the answer that I have is that this is one of the major reasons that we are doing the Medical AI Validation Consortium to be able to ask the question of how does subpopulation um, difference in the algorithm performance, uh, how that plays a role and what is the cause of that subpopulation performance? Um, is it the case that I'm gonna take something very simple that um, let's say there was a different performance on males and females in the data set? Um, and we know there's at least one good study out there that says that if you look at one data set, um, one big data set for chest x-rays, that does seem to be the case. But if I applied it to 20 data sets, would I still see that across data sets or is there something specific about this data set that caused that subpopulation difference to be more profound than it necessarily would be where there are other correlates that were responsible for that drop in performance. Um, so that's, that's very much an important motivation for the kind of work that we're doing and certainly others are doing in the community to, to try to ask and answer that, just that very question. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you once again for having me.